Uh, there's some that are definitely needed uh, help. The current Dela Seuss house down on, uh, uh, on the St. Mary Road. The John Burke house, uh, which is out on Ziegler. Uh, that's a vertical log. Somebody was starting to work on it, but that seems to have fallen by the wayside. Um, he mentioned the Senator Lynn house. If I could, we have got to save that house. Senator Lynn is one of the real significant people of St. Genevieve, and we've got to figure out how to save that house. And then across the street is the new board. Uh, the, the last owner's grandson owns it, but they've done a little work, but that's when they don't live in it. And when you don't live in a house or don't use a house, they deteriorate. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had some successes. It's not always a, a, a sad story. The Felix Rozier house, which we know as the in St. Jim, had a fire about four or five years ago. I remember the owner standing in the middle of the street as the flames were still coming out. He says, I'm going to rebuild. And he did. It's been a B&B &B since 1947. Uh, the county finally did the 1875 jail and clerk buildings uh, within the last few years. Now they weren't being used for the Chamber of Commerce and the prosecuting attorney. Uh, the J.B. Valley House uh, and Tim Conley who scored that in the last couple of years. It had sat empty for three or four years and was deteriorating. And you heard about the Lullaman Beer House here that uh, John Carroll has done. I gotta tell you, this is what I call a poster child for uh, preservation. Uh, this is, it's known by, as the Randy Hoffman House, I know it as the John MacArthur House. He was a brother-in-law of Senator Lynn. There were cars when I was a kid, and even up until the 90s, there's cars all over that lot. The house was, you could see part of the fabric of the structure. And this, the, the current owner has been restoring this over several years, and that's what it looks like now. And that looks like, what it looked like many years ago. So I, I think that, again, is a, is a poster child. <laughs> and we have some preservations underway. You've heard about the Francois Bernier house. The Del Commune house is currently being uh, 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 renovated or rehabilitated. That's another piece on Peace House, and it's located out in North Main. And later today, you're gonna hear about the Abishan house, which is a vertical log uh, French structure. As I said, not everything is a house that we try to rehabilitate. Uh, the Rozier Building, which was built in 1926, the church is now going through a whole <coughs> process of making that into a, a school uh, and parish facility. And they mentioned the City Hotel, the 1903 building. Uh, we're actually going to take it back to what it looked like pretty much in 1903 when it built, going back to mercantile style windows and had pillars in the front entrance. Uh, I gotta tell you, we are doing tax credits, and it is a big process, because this is a million and a half dollar project. I wanted to quickly kind of go through the, the time periods of preservation in St. Jane. We tend to think that all the preservation is done now, or in our current generation, but I wanted to take you back a few years. And I think the first one I want to talk about is the Louisiana Academy. There's really two places in St. Jane that's had more uh, preservation, rehabilitation done it over the years. One of them is the Louisiana Academy, and the other one's Memorial Cemetery. I'm not going to go through all the uh, segments of, or the, the time periods of the Louisiana Academy, but there's been probably five or six owners. Uh, there's been state funding went in there, there's federal funding went in there at one time. <coughs> Edmund Flagg, when he came up the river in 1836, says it was, uh, it was abandoned, never completed. It was now in a state of ruinous perfection and only enjoys the reputation of being haunted. Well, in 1849, Furman Rozier, the son of Ferdinand, uh, decided to reopen the school. This was the first school of higher education west of the Mississippi, founded in 1808 uh, as the Louisiana Academy. And he opened it up as a school, but by the Civil War, there, uh, they closed the school down and he made it his private home. So I kind of count him as one of the early preservationists of here's this structure that's a derelict haunted ruin and he's going to make it into his home. Uh, I like to look at old newspapers as, as Berger will tell you. And this is one of my favorite comments when, it, when, you, when you think about our cemetery. It is certainly a nice spectacle to see hogs wallowing in the monarch over the grave of our departed friends. Why don't the city take hold of this matter? Or even my other best one, it says the gates are frequently left open and hogs and cattle 
or allow the tramp around promiscuously <laughs> over the last week. You told me I think you need to start using some of this kind of language in there. Yeah. <laughs> but you can see these are some pictures from the turn of the century of that, of that cemetery. You can see how bad it was. And then in 1934, uh, there was a letter to the editor, editor and the guy said, boy, St. Genevieve's a wonderful place. It's interesting, but the people of St. Genevieve are letting those places slip away and be lost to history. He says all those old buildings should be preserved. And then the editorial, a few, few weeks later, uh, the fair place said, St. Genevieve, its beauty and age must be preserved. It says those picturesque frontier city landmarks are passing. I refer to the fact that modern, modern, I can't say yeah, yeah, is already creeping in on your historic little city. Some of the streets have already been wide, and luxuriously foul trees have fallen under the axe. I'm not sure if this is 1934 or 2013. Kind of the next restoration kind of thing that happened was 1931. One of the great grandsons of uh, Joan uh, Baptiste Ballet. Jules Valley, he buys uh, the Gibor house. And you can see it was not very good shape. It looks a lot like it looks now. Um, but you can see uh, in, two, in 2000, and we, it ended up living in his family for 100 years. Another family had it, uh, the Gibor family for 100 years. Then the Boyers had it for about 20 some years. And then it went to the Jules Valley family. And when Mrs. Valley died in 1972, it was donated to the Foundation for Restoration. We've opened it as a home since 1973, and we celebrated the 200th anniversary of the house a few years ago. Uh, here's an, here we go to the cemetery again. 1931, they had a cemetery association form. The American Legion was kind of the, the, the catalyzing group for that. Um, the Fair Play uh, editorial right then said, preserve St. Jim at historical landmarks should be the slogan of every citizen of St. Genevieve and thereby place your town on the map. I mean, th these are those calls for let's do something. But not a lot uh, went on uh, for a few years. But uh, in the 36, 1936, 37 time period, we had the Historic American Building Survey come in here. Uh, Peterson was quite involved with that. And they came, there were actually 52 structures in St. Genevieve County that ended up on the hands. And in the 30s, they would write up a description. Uh, they would have some photographs as the Vital St. Gentle Day House. And later on, the, the house was updated where they would have line drawings for some of the houses. And those are all online. Uh, they're out of the Library of Congress. They're a great source of information and photographs of, of old uh, houses of St. John. And someone mentioned Charles Peterson. Uh, Charles Peterson worked for the National Park Service. I think he was a, a landscape architect or something like that. But he com he's, comes to St. Louis to look for whatever they're going to do, the Jefferson Memorial. And he looks for all these French houses, and they're not there. And then he finds out, where are they at? They're in St. Genevieve. So he comes down here. And in 1939, he publishes this book, A Guide to St. Genevieve. And you saw um, Sharon put out the, showed the little document. But he went through some of the various houses and describe them. It's kind of interesting reading that we, we learn over time that what we thought was true 10 years ago, 20 years ago, may not be true. He listened to the local legends, and some of those got disproved later when we started doing dendrochronology, things of that sort. Uh, actually, Peterson was the guy that really got Habs going. He was a, a, a young landscape architect at the NPS, and he suggested that that be done in 1933, and then it took off, and they actually did St. Genevieve a little bit later. <clears throat> then in 1949, the bold, or, it was actually the, a, a lady in St. Louis, I believe, and it turned out she gave the, the bold oak house to the Colonial Danes of America in the state of Missouri, uh, and they had the, said they would purchase the, the uh, bold oak house uh, for use as a historic shrine, you can see that the bold up house at one time had been modified to be have gabled ends and, and typical what happened in St. Genevieve over time. But in 1958, they had changed it uh, or, or restored the house. At one time, it didn't have electricity or, or, or uh, heat or cooling, so it was, it was, was restored. Um, and it's been open to the public since 1958. 
Uh, the Linden House they uh, uh, procured in 1961, followed by the Lake uh, which opened in 1969. That actually, when you see what that building looked like before they did it, it was a two-story building that was actually a school that the Sisters of Loretta taught uh, many years ago. And then just recently, they acquired the J.B. Valley House in 2013. Uh, they also did, uh, they bought the old First State Bank building and have acquired what we call the Francois Valley uh, Thieves House on, on the South Gambry Road. Then in 1960, uh, St. Genevieve we, uh, was nominated and we became, uh, had our own uh, national landmark district. And that's what really took, brought a lot of focus on St. Genevieve. Uh, they said it's an 18th century French river town. It's retained much of its atmosphere of its missionary fur trading, mining, and military areas, principal seat during Spanish control, but declined after Louisiana Purchase and the emergence of St. Louis as areas main major uh, port and commercial center. You know, St. Louis always kind of looks down on good old St. Genevieve. They called us Misere or Missouri. <laughs> you saw on Sharon's thing that it was called Pancor, short of bread. <laughs> Uh, not as bad as Carondelet, which is called Eat Couche, Empty Pockets. <laughs> Nicknames are a favorite thing of St. Genevieve. I think it was Bernie Schramm that one time said the only people that are interested in St. Genevieve houses are the ones that move into town. Uh, we don't recognize it here. And I, I never told Bernie this before he died, but part of the fact is the reason is, is because our people lived in these houses. Recently, they lived in them, and we didn't prosper like St. Louis did, so we didn't have, they didn't get torn down for warehouses and stuff. Uh, but it, it, we do have people here that have been strong preservationists in the community. We talk about the Dunseys, Margaret and Frankie, Boatsy, and what was, I guess they did call it Frankie, that's not her real name. Uh, but Lorraine Stang said, Pioneer preservation, preservationist, preservationist. <laughs> They did the Amarillo House, the Johnny Ziegler House, Beach House St. Jim, Bovey, the Felix Rozier House, the Dr. Herdick House, and the Chadwell Leavenworth House. A lot of these they opened up as show homes, and they taught a whole generation of young kids to be tour guides and to be interested in the, in the history of our town. Another lady that is important is Lucille Bosler. She was, uh, uh, she was a real uh, driving force in this town for uh, keeping our records here, understanding our records, publishing them. She published four books. Uh, she was a uh, one, as one as Lorraine said, a one and a kind mover. Uh, she was always beating the drum for St. Jane when I think some people just took it for granted. And and we do a lot of times take it for granted because that's where we've lived. They, it's not that important. It's our house. Uh, but there were others. I mean, I could make a, a, a long list of people that have been important to St. Genevieve's preservation over the years, but Lucille it, it has been a special person. And then in 1967, Lucille was instrumental in founding the Foundation for Restoration of St. Genevieve. Uh, our mission is to acquire real and, and personal property, communicate knowledge of St. Genevieve, collect and preserve old homes. We don't have any ships and other things and promote, I think this is one of the most important is promote knowledge and education about what happened in St. Genevieve, St. Genevieve County in the mid Mississippi Valley. And uh, this conference is part of that mission. And uh, we have an educational research award that we give out each year for somebody writing about St. Genevieve or doing a special project. So I think that it, the foundation is, uh, you know, going to be 50 years old pretty soon, and uh, have been there. Another thing that we didn't uh, always preserve was our records. Uh, at one time in 1916, the county court said, we got all these old records, we don't care about them. And luckily, the Missouri History uh, Society in St. Louis stepped in, they went up there. Uh, Missouri, the State Historical Society uh, ended up microfilming all of them. So we have access to them now, and there's been several other projects on that. But after 50 years, uh, Lucille says they should be here in St. Genevieve. And so we did get them back uh, in 1968. And here in 1969 was the first of our, uh, I'm kind of switching between people that do personal uh, preservation efforts and what the city gets involved. So in 1969, we finally got the city and again, this is the foundation, Lorraine's, uh, or uh, Lucille Bosler. 
pushing the city to establish what we call the Urban Design and Landmarks Commission. Uh, they could do, uh, designate historic landmarks. Uh, they had what, the, what it had, what kind of criteria was important to, to get that kind of designation. <coughs> Sometimes there were appeals. People didn't always want to have a historic mm -hmm. uh, sign on their house. Uh, and then they started reviewing things that uh, were affecting those houses, either demolition or uh, outside alteration, repair. And even getting, this uh, enabled the commission to look at what the city was doing. Because a lot of times governments tend to rough, run roughshod over preservation. And like tearing down the house next to the city hall and, and, and several others. Um, in 1970, uh, the Missouri <coughs> Department of Natural Resources comes to town. They get the uh, Felix Valley House, which was built in 1818. Uh, in 1991, they got the Benjamin Shaw House, which is, is next door. It's this little building here. And in 1979, they opened up the Felix Valley as a state park. And then Booker uh, Rucker sitting back there is pretty instrumental in getting us from 1970 to this 1979 opening. Um, the state in 93 got the Kern Delasus House, so after the, the flood of 93 and in 94, uh, got the Bove Amaro, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, the Bove Amaro is a vertical log poteau en terre, so it's one of the three important houses uh, in that architectural style in town. I call this uh, Memorial Cemetery Deja Vu. Remember back in 1934, they, were taught, they had this committee that was working on improving the cemetery. Well, they come back in 1970, and I got this quote out of the newspaper. It says, on June 22nd, after three years of pleading, begging, threatening, working, and worrying, work finally started on repairs on the cemetery. Isn't that about <laughs> preservation sometimes? Yeah. <laughs> you really got to go after it. They, they did the repair some tombstones and, and the wall. And then in 1970, the Bolduc becomes a National Historic Landmark. Uh, and they have that designation. So again, that's, that's starting to get national attention on St. Genevieve. And in 1971, the Landmarks, the Urban Design and Landmarks Commission established what our first historic district. It's been changed since then. Uh, this is the Mississippi River. We probably ought to turn it the other way. Uh, but it kind of goes out the South Gabbery uh, Creek area to encompass houses like where uh, John did the uh, Lala Deer House. <clears throat> then in 1978, they come back and do another uh, historic uh, preservation ordinances. Uh, and this is kind of more general kind of stuff. That they wanted to preserve the historic features of the historic district area, allow for the adaptation of the historic district to economic and functional requirements, provide for an art environment which will promote the future development of the historic district, and then encourage the use for education, uh, welfare, and pleasure. And that kind of fits in with our tourism industry, having, having this, this kind of ordinance. In the 1980s, the University of Missouri uh, came here uh, over a number of years. And I probably don't have everything they do, but they, they did another review of uh, the, uh, uh, the buildings in town. Uh, a lot of times, we don't know that a building's even a vertical law because they're hidden. Uh, Ozzy Overby came down, they started dating houses using dendrochronology. That irritated a lot of people that thought their house was a 1770 house and it was really a 1795 or whatever. Uh, and there's still arguments about, about that, so it's like when did the town get started. Uh, they prepared drawings on the houses and worked on our historic re records. Susan Platter was, uh, Dr. Susan Platter was very involved. So I mean, uh, uh, some, some outside help helping us take a look at, at what we're doing here. We've had a few wins for preservation. Uh, the Beckett Rebow uh, was owned by a, an African American family, but it's restored. It's probably one of the best looking. What, when we start thinking of a, a mid Mississippi Valley French colonial house, that's kind of what it looks like. And uh, yes. what, what was it known by an African American family for like a hundred years? I'm, I'm not sure of the, the time period, but you're probably right. It, it has been changed a lot. This actually is a restoration, and we have very few restorations. The Bulldog House was restored, uh, and, and I'm talking without electricity and that sort of thing. Uh, the Beckett Rebel is probably a good example of that. Felix Valley is very close, and the, there's one more that I probably should, the, the uh, Lady Lure House. The other thing that happened, the other success in 1984 was what we call the Jacquard uh, 
Stanton building. This county owned that, and they were going to tear it down. <coughs> and Lucille and a bunch of other people said, we can't, we don't want to, this, this is German arch uh, architecture that came to St. Yeah. Henry. We can't let it go. And there was, I mean, was editorial after editorial and letters to the editor, and they finally say that a private individual, du the Duval family, bought it and restored it, and it was a certified rehabilitation, and it's being used to this day. Then in 1992, we had another artist that kind of went back to that last one um, <coughs> and, and, and repealed it, or left all the existing uh, district and landmark designations, but then it started requiring certificates of appropriateness. And that means you got to go to the city and get, or to the Landmarks Commission to get things approved before you can do certain things to the house. In the early days, they got kind of crazy, <coughs> and we're talking about paint colors and stuff like that. Uh, but anything, any, now anything that requires a building permit, demolition in part or in whole, not just in the historic district, but in the entire part of the entire town of St. Genevieve, if it starts affecting the exterior uh, appearance, uh, you're gonna, you have to go before them. An archeological resource, I mean, we, we're sitting here for 200 and something years, we have the Mississippian culture here, we have the uh, mm -hmm. uh, Little Osage, so that's getting to be, uh, more important, and we don't do a lot on that. And then the certificate of authority went to the landmarks commission, and the board of, uh, they had a different method of doing appeals. In 1992, we became a certified local government. Uh, that enabled us. That's with the state of Missouri. You had to have a local historic preservation ordinance, uh, a commission, maintain a system for ongoing surveys provide for public participation, and perform the uh, responsibilities that come from the state uh, that, that are de uh, delegated to the local government. In 1993, uh, about June 1st, we were named one of the 11 most endangered historic places in the United States. And the National Histor uh, Trust for Historic Preservation said the town has a plague of periodic flooding and lack of resources to preserve these historically significant buildings. This is June 1st, 1993. <laughs> <laughs> this is August 10th, yes. 1993. This is the Nicholas Shawnee House that we call the Green Tree Tavern. Here's the Amaro House with a boat tied up in front of it, and that's the, uh, the Beckett Renault House that had been previously restored. So they were pretty prophetic about that. Uh, in 1994, uh, well, actually, after the flood of 93, there was the Friend Heritage uh, uh, Relief Committee, and out of that came a, a very good organization called La Les Me, and uh, Elizabeth talked about that a little bit <coughs> earlier. They are dedicated to the preservation and interpretation of Missouri's French Creole heritage and culture. They do as you, you, a lot of symposiums, lectures, tours, programs. And more importantly, over the years, they provided a lot of funding for the uh, Beauvais Amaro House uh, with uh, maintenance items. They recently did a lot of work in the foundation of the house, a new roof. And if you've never been in the Amaro House, there's a beautiful diorama of St. Joseph, <coughs> what it looked like in 1932, and that was also funded by the place. I didn't <laughs> Uh, and they also uh, really pushed for this French Creole corridor because I think we all recognize that that we're more than Hollywood and the law and not just Missouri and, and Illinois. We were called the Illinois country even after Illinois became British. So, uh, And here's Memorial Cemetery, Deja Deja Vu. <laughs> It was starting to deteriorate again. The foundation, in cooperation, it was a joint uh, public-private uh, <coughs> project. Uh, we ended up with a Save America's Treasures grant. We put up a new fence. We cleaned up a lot of, uh, of the, the debris around there. I don't know. Since 1996, I think we've carried out 40 truckloads of debris oh, out of the cemetery. You're missing three iron crosses. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what that is. Tombstone repair. We did, we've done uh, lands, uh, landscaping in the cemetery to make it more attractive. Ground penetrating radar. We wanted to find out where the mass burial of the Dr. Franklin II people were at uh, from 1852. Location mapping of all the um, uh, tombstones, signage, 
and then uh, retardation. We were very lucky to get Booker Rucker as our project leader, and he's still working on this. We still we just had a meeting Friday about future actions for the cemetery. In any rehabilitation or preservation, you got to keep at it because it's if you don't, it it goes back. Um, I, I wanted to put something up here about uh, Southeast Missouri State. In 1980, they started offering a degree in historic preservation. And then in 1996, they started doing what's called, annually called the Field School, where they bring a group of students up, and for two weeks, they do projects around St. James. They will measure a house, they take, uh, learn how to photograph, they learn to do records, they do a project in a museum. So it's, it's teaching our future professional preservationists how to do their job. And I threw this in also in, in 2001, Larry and Donna Marler, residents of St. Genevieve, endowed a ch the chair for historic preservation in down at SEMO. So I think that's a dedication to preservation from a local uh, <coughs> person. Endowing a chair is about a million dollar deal these days. In 2001, we adopt or we developed our own set of guidelines based on the, the Department of Interior uh, guidelines. And it covers, uh, it shows what the historic districts are. There's a, a goes in the windows, doors, all kinds of things, and gives you guidance on how, if you're going to do a change, this is how you should do it. So, and that's available to the public here. Uh, in 2001, by the way, after 1993, I forgot to mention. Remember on that, that, I had that post that was on the side with the flood mm -hmm. pictures. At the very top of that post was the 1993 flood at 49.75 feet. Two years later, we had one at 44 feet. And so we were really uh, twice having a problem there. Before that, the highest flood was 41 feet. So you can see how big that 93 was. Well, in uh, June of 2001, the turnover of the levy was finally done. Um, June the 9th, they closed the gates for the first time. Really close. I, I like uh, Alvin Dunsey's. He says we've been fighting the river, that should be river, for years, and now within a couple of hours, we can provide protection. It's an extraordinary day, amazing. Um, that sign that was up here with the flood part, that's going to commemorate all of that. But really, we got this levy not because of the economic value of the levy, because of our historic homes. And people tend to forget that now. We gotta keep that in front of people that these homes are the reason that we don't worry now when we have a flood. And then 2002, we get an update on our register of historic places and you start getting to argue about different, should it be on there, shouldn't it be on there, what's a contributing house, what's a supporting house. And in 2006, after a lot of work, we, the uh, Congress passed a law which we call the National Park Study that authorized the Secretary of Inter Interior to do a study of the suitability and feasibility of designating portions of the county as a unit of the National Park System. And this is to do a French colonial uh, item. And it, it, they started to talking about the Becca de Gold, the Amarillo, and uh, Will Hawthorne. We have to teach them how to spell Amarillo, spell two different ways here. Uh, this is a three-year study, and let's see, we're in the seventh year. <laughs> and this fall, they're supposed to be holding a public hearing out, ready to done, be done with it. There's four parts to that study. Uh, Bonnie was very instrumental. Bonnie stepping off and doing the feasible, uh, or the uh, historical significance study. We knew that was a slam dunk, but uh, thanks, Bonnie, for working on that. Another win for preservation, sometimes uh, like that 93 flood in front of the Amarillo house, they built up the, <coughs> the uh, roadway about four or five feet and Hillard Goldman had the house and he sued the city. He says you got to take it back to what it looked like before the flood. So now we have a nice stone wall in front of the, uh, amp or the Green Tree Tavern or Nicholas Johnny house uh, exposed. It was there all along, just buried. And then we come back and we do another historic uh, preservation ordinance. Uh, then it, it establishes our current Landmarks Commission. There's seven people on it. Uh, they do the design review and the, uh, issue the appropriate uh, certificates of appropriateness. And now any appeal from there, instead of going to the other commission that was, was available, now goes to the Board of Aldermen. Um, that's really the last of the uh, 
the ordinances that we've had here in St. Genevieve. And then in 2007, uh, uh, Lazy Me started championing getting St. Genevieve and the Creole Corridor uh, included in a UNESCO World Heritage List. Uh, that's a very difficult process. You've got to get, uh, they get submitted, then they have to go to the, the national and they select it down to three and then it goes to the world. And we haven't made the list yet, but that doesn't mean we're not going to keep uh, fighting for that. Um, Vicki, at that, when there was a meeting, and, and we have this something special mm -hmm. here, and this is an opportunity to grant recognition of that fact. You just have to make the case first to the federal authorities and then to the world. And we are still under uh, further consideration. Right, right. And it, it dropped Mount Vernon and Savannah, Georgia, but they haven't dropped us. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times people, people here in St. Jimmy don't know what the rules are, so in 2007 the foundation put out a guide for property owners, and, and in that guide we talked about the state Missouri tax credits, the national tax credits, and what ordinances, and who they should contact, that sort of thing. The biggest fights we've ever had here in St. James when somebody does something, gets a third of the way into the, the project, and then find out, A, they needed a building permit, or two, they had to go to landmarks, and then all hell breaks loose. So you gotta get people understanding that beforehand. And then in 2009, we had another group farm here called the Downtown Renewal Group that's based on the National Trust Main Street uh, program, and they've been very active uh, here and, and really trying to, and you know, the whole premise of Main Street is a preservation through use. And we've got to get our storefronts that are empty, our buildings that are empty, uh, back in use so that they, they will be with us in the future. And probably the one of the most significant things recently is in earlier this year in March, the, the city alderman passed what is known as the Downtown Tax Incremental Funding uh, Program. It's our second TIF. Uh, it's a little different than most TIFs. A lot of times in TIFs, they loan you money on the program. In this one, you've got to put all your own money up front. But if you increase your property value and sales tax over the 2012 base, you can get all of the increase of your property tax over the 2012 base. And half of the local sales tax, which is 2%, you can do that for up until 2036. This is, when you put his, uh, the, the state of Missouri, the federal tax credits, and a TIF together, it's a very good reason to do a development. To get the feds, you have to do that, make it a, a, an income producing thing. And one of the things, I'm, when I look at St. Genevieve, but we have these beautiful homes like the B Board and the Bull Duke and the Felix Valley. How are we gonna get more people like John Carroll to do a little modest cabin? I mean, not everybody lived in the fancy houses. The John Burke. Uh, we and, and turning them into a business and getting the advantage because if it's a, it was a private home, there's no sales tax in 2012. You know, and the property tax is probably low. So it, these are the incentives that we need to use, and we need to find uses for these little buildings. Kids these days do not want a two room room cabin for a starter home. <laughs> if it doesn't have three bedrooms and three baths. So this, I think this is a, an important tool. They may not stay as a private home, but we can preserve them for the future. Uh, I'm just going to quickly tell you a little bit about some recognition over the years. And, uh, because I think it's part of the fact that St. Genevieve has had a preservation effort for a lot of years. In 1977, the National Trust gave Lucille Bosler the Garden Gray Award, and in 1983, 1983, the Foundation won a National Award from the American Association of State and Local History. We started our own award called the uh, Harry and Constance Matthews Award. Uh, Frank and Shirley Myers were the first one, and we, the Foundation didn't give it out for a lot of years, but we're trying to make up for lost time and start recognizing those people that have done stuff to preserve St. Genevieve. And, and, and actually, it could be a long list because we've had a lot of good effort here. We just lament the losses every time. Uh, in 2005, the Boulder House was uh, given a Preserve America Award. And in 2007, the city became a Preserve America community. I think there were only two others at the time in the state of Missouri. And in 2008, we became uh, the National Trust named St. Genevieve as one of its dozen distinctive destinations. 
Um, you know, they talk about singular collection of 18th century French colonial structures, a concentration greater than anywhere else in the United States. And, and that's probably true. There's a few others around there, but we, we have more of them here. We haven't discovered all of them yet. And then some preservations awards. We, uh, the foundation get, uh, got the McReynolds Award in 2007 for our Memorial Cemetery Restoration Project. And John, uh, the Lala Mandir House, I guess it was, it was that's the way the, the reward, uh, award was given, got the Missouri Alliance for Historic Preservation Award this year. And this is the comment John, John said, he was quoted, it's a wonderful thing to preserve the grand houses and the grand buildings, but it's also important to preserve these modest structures where ordinary people in our community lived, worked, and maintained. And that's why, you know, losing all these little outbuildings has really changed what the fabric of our, our community looks like, because those were really prevalent back in a lot of years. John's also re, re uh, have his chicken coop too. <laughs> and we've even gotten some cultural awards uh, back in 2007. Seven, we got the Missouri Governor's Award for what we call the Spirit Reunion, uh, which is coming up October 26th. It's where we tell stories of people buried in the cemetery. It's one of our fundraisers. And then in 2009, Patty Nagger got a Missouri Humanities Award for the work that she's done for over 25 years now with what we call the Petit Jean Tours, and she teaches young children, as young as five, to sing French and German songs, and it's kind of keeping that tradition of, of our culture, French culture and our German culture alive. I'm gonna kind of close with uh, what I call the four Ps. <laughs> A friend of mine in the government came up with this. We were talking about cultural changes in factories and, and talking about the four Ps, and I, to me, preservation kind of requires the four Ps. Uh, you got to have a passion for it. Uh, it's not easy to take a $14,500 house and put $150,000 in it or $100,000 and go through all of that. Uh, it would have been easier to tear the hotel building down and start from scratch. I, I can guarantee that. Uh, but you gotta have that passion. You gotta be persistent, and persistent means you fight for preservation today, you do it tomorrow, you do it, uh, uh, you, just, you just keep after it, and, and when people say you can't do it, you figure out ways to make it done, and persevere over time. Uh, again, and fighting the fight sometimes wears you down, but you gotta still get there. And the last was uh, pizza, and when this guy told me pizza, I thought, what the heck are you talking about? Well, pizza means is that you got to share the little successes. It makes the heart feel better. It gives you uh, the, the momentum to keep moving. So maybe one of these years we'll have pizza for lunch here. <laughs> there, have, there have been some successes. So that's preservation and rehabilitation and restoration in St. Genic over the last 160-some years. <laughs> Thank you for watching Channel 798. Thank you for watching Channel 7 and 98. Uh.
Bye. Thank you very much for watching the channel 798.